Welcome to Sermon Framewave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 24, 2021, are from Jeremiah chapter 31, 7 through 9. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Job chapter 42, 1 through 6 and 10 through 17. Psalm 126, we continue in our reading of Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28, and Mark 10, 46 through 52, the healing of blind Bartimaeus. I'm so glad that the story falls when it does this year, because if my memory is correct, for the last several years B, it has fallen on Reformation Sunday, and some people choose to go Reformation-y and skip poor Bartimaeus. And uh, so now he, you have no excuse to skip over this passage, which actually would be a great preaching text for a Reformation Day service, I think. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it brings a lot of things to a close. We've, we've talked a bit about the central section in Mark's gospel, the middle of chapter eight, to the end of chapter 10, where Jesus suddenly starts to talk a lot about his uh, suffering, death, and resurrection, where he also invites a lot of people to follow him, offers a lot of very difficult teaching that makes it sound like following him is out of reach, or at least unpleasant. And here you have this story that's both a healing and a call at the same time. You've got a lot of classic Markan things like obstacles, you know, Bartimaeus trying to encounter Jesus and, and the crowd gets in his way and uh, Jesus calls him. He says the exact same thing to him. What do you want me to do for you? That he said to James and John earlier in chapter 10 when they wanted to sit at his right and left. And it ends with Bartimaeus following Jesus along the way. And we know where the way is leading in, in Mark's gospel. And he's a follower, which again, I think I say this every year, be over and over again. In Mark's gospel, Jesus wants followers. That's what kind of the hallmark verb for discipleship. Uh, go where Jesus is, follow him to the cross. And that's exactly what Bartimaeus does. And it's the last we hear of him, but at least as this ends, it's a reminder that discipleship is still possible. And it might be more accessible or apprehendable, or at least directed toward the people you wouldn't expect, people alongside the road who seem to be lacking insight, perhaps, or not having the insider knowledge that the disciples have. Yeah, the, the, so many, like every, everything you just said, uh, Matt, there's so many uh, great ways in which we're bringing, you know, this section of, of Mark to a close. And that, you know, not only uh, that you have this, this, this following of a rather unexpected disciple, but even that short uh, the short transition from him sitting by the roadside is the NRSV translation, but the word there is way, you know, sitting along the way, and then he follows Jesus on the way. And so you've had the, that contrast of you've had the disciples following Jesus this whole time, and you're not really sure where they are. And yet in the space of one, two, three, four, five, six verses, I have to count there for a minute. Yeah, in the space of six verses, you have this um, Bartimaeus who is sitting along the way, just sitting there, and then moves to moves to following him. And so, it not not only is it this, there's it's still possibility for followers, but uh, but that that following can happen rather rapidly. Uh, and I think that there's something uh, there's something there as well. And as you said, Matt, that the importance of recognizing that this is therefore. Yes, absolutely, as a healing, which is bracketed by the first healing in this section uh, that we had at the of the blind man at Bethsaida, and how the way in which both of those healings bracket this section of Mark, uh, but but even more so a call story, and a call story that that where you have the blind man recognizing aspects of Jesus uh, that 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 nobody else has recognized. Uh, for example, like son of David, this is the first time that term is used in the gospel of Mark. And, and so, so that recognition of Jesus 
you know, Jesus' ancestry or where does he come from and, and what, does, what does his kingship mean and what is it connected to, which will be taken up in, in the section, second section of the gospel. So it's, uh, it's this, this call story that is really rather unexpected, but has these extraordinary elements in it that, that ends up being a really significant transition going into, uh, which is the very next chapter of the entry into Jerusalem. I love this detail in this story. I love the detail um, that he, uh, uh, after uh, they say to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So he threw off his cloak uh, and he sprang up, he jumped up and ran to Jesus, right? I mean, it's, uh, I think it was Eric Bredo that uh, first pointed out that lovely thing that um, the blind one who's able to see who Jesus is, uh, so to speak, is then he, he jumps up and and he throws away his most valuable possession, his cloak, uh, and uh, runs to Jesus. And then, and then, of course, uh, his sight is regained, and he follows him on the way. Like you guys have already mentioned that. Um, I do. I do love to play this off against the 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 healing of the blind person at the start of this middle section that we've talked about. That which contains, you know, the the three teachings of the passion, and it contains. Um, you know, Peter's confession and the transfiguration. Uh, and that's the only miracle Jesus does. The other one that only half works the first time. Remember, so the guy, uh, Jesus, he, you know, does what he does to him. And he says, well, I, I can see, I can see, but it looks like the tree, the, the people look like trees are walking, right? So then Jesus has to do it again. I think, which is, that's sort of a paired with this one. Where, where he is um, fully restored right away and then follows Jesus. It's a great contrast. And I think it's trying to tell us um, something about the nature of discipleship. The, the uh, you know, in some ways, this is a classic healing story in terms of the way it's, you know, a form critic from, from Germany in the 19th century would show us all of the, the parts here. It's also important to talk about how I think Mark's using blindness to indicate lack of insight or faithlessness or ignorance or things like that, and to and to be aware of that and to name that and correct that when preaching. That and in some ways the story helps you do that because it's somebody you would expect would know nothing. I mean, because he's had no contact with Jesus, it appears, and yet he knows this name or this title, Son of David. Uh, he has this insight that's more keen, more perceptive. Than anybody else in the central section of Mark's gospel uh, at this point. So on the one hand, it it, it 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 goes along with this trope about blindness. On the other hand, it, it might even subvert it or at least give the preacher permission to subvert that in particular ways and to examine the ways in which we also imagine that people who, uh, who suffer in certain ways or who um, go through life with different uh, abilities are somehow suffering for their sins. We talk about this a lot with miracle stories or healing stories, but to note, I think it's especially acute here because of the placement of the story and, and because it has that line, your faith has made you well, or your faith has saved you. Well, and that's where uh, I don't want to go there quite yet, but, uh, but I think the commentary on the website on Jeremiah, which is the, of course, Old Testament pairing, uh, is a is a really fine commentary on its own when you think about uh, disability and biblical interpretation, and so that even to bring even to read that on its own, regardless of connection with Jeremiah, into some of the comments and correctives you're you're making, Matt, I think would be helpful for the preacher. I think you know a couple other things that strike me with this passage for preaching. Uh, one is uh, the uh, verse 52 of go, your faith has made you well, as you just said, Matt, that the, the verb there is sozo, your faith has saved you. And I, uh, and, and then right next to that, immediately he regained his sight. And so there's this really interesting invitation to what does salvation mean in this gospel? Um, and what does salvation particularly mean here? 
especially as we go back to uh, which we've done throughout this entire year of Mark 1, 14 to 15, and the invitation to see the kingdom of God has come near, repent, that is, change your perspective. And so we have someone here who is embodying that, who is embodying that, that change of perspective uh, or an ability to see things that... Um, that he that he wasn't able to see not necessarily because he was blind but the, there's a that interaction with jesus jesus has caused that that new sight i think another uh another theme here is i'm not quite sure how to formulate it yet but that says something to the disciples in terms of their uh i don't know if the word is intercession here but you know, that, that, I don't know if that's quite right. Maybe you two can help me out with this, but, the, but Bartimaeus begins to shout and say, and then many sternly ordered and be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. Jesus said, still call him here. And they called the blind man uh, and said, he's calling you. So there's this role that the crowd or the disciples take on that are is sort of a participant in the calling, if you will, or, I don't know, um, again, exactly what I'm trying to say, but I think there's an important role here that, that, that they hear what Jesus is asking and they, and they say, you know, he is calling you, uh, that affirmate, that moment of affirmation or that moment of, of recognition on their part, that this, that this man is also being called into, uh, the kingdom of God. Well, it's, it's kind of humorous or kind of shameful. If they're the same ones who are telling him to be quiet, then as soon as Jesus says, call him over here, they're like, oh, hey, actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> come step yeah. right up. You know, you've got to see that. It reminds me of two things. One is that faith in Mark often has to overcome some kind of obstacle, whether it's the woman suffering from the hemorrhage who's got to navigate the crowd or Jairus, whose daughter already dies, or the Syrophoenician woman and uh, but also the story reminds me of, of, uh, of Mark chapter six and the feeding of the 5,000 plus where the disciples are saying, send the crowd away. And Jesus says, well, you give them something to eat. And Jesus involves them in the distribution of the food and the cleaning up afterwards. So here, instead of Jesus getting off the road and wandering over and, and meeting him face to face, he makes his followers be um, intermediaries, ministers in some ways of the, of the, of the healing and the calling. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that, I think that, that in and of itself could be a, an important homiletical direction and particularly, yeah, it's not an individual, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but no, I, it, it, well, in particularly at this location in the narrative where uh, things are going to shift dramatically and what kind of role are the disciples going to be called to take on in Jesus absence. And so that, that, yeah, that just add, I think that just that awareness of that narrative location uh, underscores what what you are saying, Matt. Well, should we move to Jeremiah? Yeah, and I, uh, of course, the connection is the blind and the lame. Uh, but the uh, again, I, as I already said, I would commend the commentary to, to uh, all preachers to read with regard to. Uh, thinking about uh, what what difference does it make to read a text through the lens of disability, uh, and it's a, a really fine commentary. Uh, but I, I, you know, what what the the what was really striking to me, um, either connected to Bartimaeus or just on its own. And it, you know, with weeping they shall come, with consolations I will lead them back. Um, of this of this theme of of being scattered and then coming back, which the preacher might say, you know, depending on what the context is and where we are in the COVID pandemic, <laughs> uh, that maybe that's a theme and and now and and the return to fall activities and such of of a reminder of this promise of God that what is scattered and what is spread out to the farthest parts will which, and the parts probably never seemed <laughs> as far as they were the last year and a half of this promise of leading them back. So that's the, that's the, my main takeaway uh, with this, uh, with this passage this time around. You know, I think the, uh, I, th I think for me, uh, 
first of all, it is a beautiful commentary by Elaine James, as always when she writes. Um, the contrast is that in the Gospels, uh, disability is always something to be fixed. And so, so you, you get the blind man who gets his sight back. But in Jeremiah, uh, uh, the lame and the blind are not um, healed. They remain, but they're gathered. And so the, the contrast for me is that, that God's action of gathering those who have been traumatized, in this case, uh, one assumes uh, by the destruction of Jerusalem and then the enforced exile, the deportations, uh, they're brought back and um, the line with weeping, they shall come. And uh, uh, Lane James has a nice detail on there just about stopping and just lingering on that, but what tears mean. And, uh, and I found that really helpful. It doesn't necessarily mean their weeping is going to stop. Um, or that the consolations will be complete. And I do think that this is a, it's a different metaphor for how we might understand church or synagogue that is God's gathered people, that uh, God's gathered people includes these. They're not healed or restored in any, any way. Um, and yet there's a place for them that they find a community here uh, around God and God's presence in the community rather than just being left out there. Uh, which though any sort of traumatic or disabling experience can isolate. I appreciate the comment about reading this as well now after a year and a half of pandemic and, and a lot of people I have talked to in their congregations have discovered new ways of creating community online, but also accessibility, how that has changed. Uh, congregations I know that are experiencing people who <clears throat> resided more at the outskirts of, of kind of regular congregational life, who now, because of all the online access, uh, are much more involved, much more present. And a lot of that turns out to be accessibility issues, whether that's physical, psychological, uh, a whole host of other things. And I'm sure some people listening are, are experiencing this, but a way of, of, of bringing that up, of talking about how do we as well um, think about community as a gift from God that maybe tries to embody some of these things as well that really does provide belonging and welcome. And, and sometimes you need a real shock to the system to realize when you're not doing that or when you're actually inhibiting that by your ordinary ways of doing things. Yeah, I mean, Luther talks about community in uh, a document called the Small Call of Articles uh, for all our non-Lutheran um, Listeners. It's Bandit, the podcast. I know, yeah, a giant, the, a giant thing just walked in front of your camera there. Yes, this is Bandit, the podcast. He, he, yeah, he, he who's he, on our he, other podcast. So, yeah. <laughs> so what's he uh, doing on this one? He doesn't know well, the difference. He likes to appear. Crossover is um, a great way to build an audience. There you go. So um, Luther talks about the means of grace is not just the word of God and the sacraments, but actually the community. Uh, the the gathered uh, the gathered community uh, through their conversations and consolations are a means of grace. Um, at a church, uh, a congregation I used to belong to that my parents also belonged to, my dad would say, um, "The best thing about this congregation is the coffee hour." And he wasn't putting down the worship, but he was talking about how meaningful it was to connect with people and. Uh, share joys and sorrows and troubles during those times and uh, that he, just looking forward and it does kind of remind me i don't remember the uh there is a there's a, a famous jewish story of a of a sort of um agnostic son who is chastising his father who's an atheist for going to synagogue and the father says about some other uh you know jew let's just, well, I'll just call him abraham that's not the name you know Abraham goes to, uh, to synagogue, uh, talk to God. I go to talk to Abraham. Uh, that uh, that the, the meaning of community is uh, so important. And of course, the Christian community is, uh, must take on the sign of the cross. So back to Mark, right? We're accused, we're, we are a cruciform community, um, different than other sorts of communities. But we should really move on. Uh, we could spend multiple podcasts talking about nothing other 
than Job 42. So though, for those who have been in Job uh, four weeks, this is it. Uh, this is the end. And the first thing, I'm livid that they cut out verses seven through nine. But let me come back to livid? that. Livid? Livid. Livid. Because wow. those verses um, actually capture the whole point of the book. Well, why don't you, why don't you continue on with that? Yeah, go on. Uh, well, first, first of all, we have to address 42.6. The most difficult and, well, the most contested verse probably in the whole Old Testament for translation. There's other verses that are probably more, even, even as difficult to translate as 42.6. Um, but this one is the most contested. So Job, uh, Job has said, um, oh, that my uh, you know, redeemer, that is God, would come down and I would question him or he would question me, but we'd have it out. So then God shows up. We had this last week and God says, all right, here's what we're going to do. Um, I'll question you. And then he asks him all these questions. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did this? Uh, and, and sort of the point, it, I think, is in some ways, you don't know how, how the universe runs. You have only your very limited perspective, and you don't know how the universe runs. So then Job says, I know that you can do all these things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. And then I'm uh, skipping to verse six. The traditional translation in NRSV is, therefore, I despise myself. The word myself does not occur in Hebrew. And I repent in dust and ashes. So uh, uh, Carol Newsom um, has gathered together, uh, see if I can pull it up here, uh, somewhere. Uh, uh, a bunch of ways of translating this. Um, therefore, I retract my words and repent of dust and ashes. Therefore, I reject and forswear. That is, he's not going to be mourning uh, and so on. And then recently, Bill Brown uh, has offered a different one, which I find the most compelling. The word um, that is translated as um, despise or repent, actually repent, can mean comfort. Everywhere else in the book of Job, it is translated as comfort. Uh, Job's friends come to comfort him, and then they don't. So uh, a different way of translating it is something essentially, I withdraw my case against you, and I am comforted. I'm finally comforted uh, that God's expansion of Job's vision grants Job the comfort that he's been looking for the entire book. And I find that uh, the most helpful. Uh, uh, Bill, I know you're not listening, but uh, there you go. You've convinced me. All right. So that brings us then to verses seven through nine, like I said, which I think are the, uh, the key to the book. So I have to pull this up again. Here we are. Are you ready? Then God turns to Eliphaz and says, my anger burns against you and your friends, for you have not spoken, and it, almost every version translates it like this, you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Well, that's not true. Job's words about God have been proven to be not true, but that's not what it says in Hebrew. What it says is you have not spoken to me as is right as Job has. And it says that twice. In other words, in times of trauma, fixing someone's theology, which is what Job's friends try to do, they never pray. They only argue with Job. This is not how you grant pastoral care. Job prays to God. And even though God says all your words are wrong, it's still, he's doing the right thing. And then uh, God says, ask Job to pray for you, uh, for your forgiveness. I'll listen to him. And then that's what happens. So I think that to me is the point of one of the biggest points of the book is that um, pray with people and pray when you are uh, suffering. It's not the right time to fix anyone's theology. Great. Mic drop. <laughs> yeah, I, I have nothing to add, except maybe, well, I guess that last part really preaches well. <laughs> 
if a preacher is going to add those verses. Um, I think a lot of people go to the happy ending part here, verses 10 through 17, mm -hmm. and want to know what do we make of all the restoration? Is that somehow supposed to fix things or what is that? It's kind of morally problematic to assume that somehow this blessing at the end undoes all of the grief and, and trauma earlier on, but it's probably too much in chapter 42 for one sermon to cover all those things. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right, and I, I I didn't prepare a speech on the on the Disney World ending where uh, Job gets everything back, but it is worth pointing out that uh, the the names of the daughters are given here, not the sons, and the daughters have uh, very playful names, um, and I of course don't have in my head. Uh, uh, Catherine Schifferdicker writes nicely about this. Uh, I think she's probably written some commentaries on our website about this that you can find. Um, but right the Bible now, says it's dove, cinnamon, and horn of antinomy. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, I what or what antinomy. I had. Well, <laughs> what you know, one thing about the for, the fortunes of Job being restored that I hadn't really thought about before. It's like one of those obvious things, but it just didn't really cross my mind. Is that the commentary points out? that these fortunes, according to the narrative, the fact that he has children, uh, daughters, uh, that the logic of the narrative requires the passing of time for the restoration to be complete. Uh, and so I'm not sure what I make of that, but there's something, there's something in that that's like, it's not like the daughters just were you know, the stork brought them and, and plopped them into the middle, back into the middle of Job's <laughs> life again. I mean, it, it takes a while to have kids, you know, and, uh, especially and 10. so especially 10. So we're talking, you know, biologically, the, the reality is this is not a, um, an immediate restoration. This is a, this is a, this is a commitment to restoration, but it, it, it's, it's, um, 10 years in the making. And so, there's something about that too that that the, that the silence of that or the the uh, that we don't we don't have insight into uh, what happened in in between <laughs> the promise and the restoration that that uh, invites you know invites theological imagination and invites um, and invites what what does it mean to be in a relationship with God and and the further conversations that Job perhaps had with God over those 10 yeah. years. Uh, I just, I like that. I like that silence there that, that, um, that, that then I think also doesn't allow for that easy answer of, well, you know, his life is restored. I mean, there's there that absence of narrative with regard to that, I think helps us uh, with that. It does, by the way, the third child's uh, third daughter's name is box of eyeshadow. Uh, Matt, according to uh, my translation. So uh, okay, we have, I, will, I will bow to you. We that. have gone on uh, at quite length, so we have to be very brief about the last two texts. Uh, psalm 126 is just a beautiful psalm about restoration, but then about repeated requests for new restoration. One of the great things about it is this um, this line, those who sow in tears May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, um, shall come home with shouts of joy. Uh, it's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great text for around harvest time, which uh, we still are for some uh, places. Uh, even, and maybe, maybe it's especially fitting that, uh, especially in our, on our continent, it's been such a drought. Uh, a lot of farmers, uh, might have no harvest this year. And so this is, uh, this is maybe a text really to dress into that for those who live in small town and rural America, uh, uh, depending on the state of the harvest to talk about uh, the resilience of creation and God's, God's promise to sustain uh, and that abundance. Um, God's promise of abundance doesn't mean abundance at all times and in all places, but uh, over the over the force of life, and that uh, that God that God does uh, 
remain with us and, and bring restoration after periods of, of what drought and no harvest. Well, and also I think too, when you were saying that, Ralph, I was thinking also with COVID and how, how are we talking about what's happening with the church now with, with the pandemic and what, what, what kind of restoration is God about with the church uh, in, this, in this space and place? And so maybe that's the homiletical direction that the preacher takes uh, toward uh, the promise of restoration, that, but it might take 10 years like it did with Job. And that the 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 psalm becomes uh, becomes our promise of response in that, or a, a liturgical response to to those promises of God. Yep. Hebrews seven fourth, our fourth in our run with Hebrews. Yes, here we are. Okay, and that's so it. thanks for listening. That's it. To thanks for listening. <laughs> you can find this and many other fabulous resources at workingpreacher.org. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Now, uh, I think uh, the 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 role of Jesus here as uh, as intercessor, I think, is the is where I was landing in particular. And um, the way in which that can be misconstrued um, in terms of what, you know, what does it actually mean to intercede for someone or to, uh, yeah. And, um, and I, I just, I wonder if that is something that people um, needs some help uh, thinking about in terms of what what is it that they what is it they assume by intercession uh, that that uh, there's many ways that you can understand what that role is of Jesus and so uh, that was one direction I thought like what does it mean to call Jesus our intercessor and how might how might a sermon unpack uh, unpack what that what what that description of Jesus might be.